from the cloudy and windy Copenhagen. Welcome to the webinar, The Building Blocks of Residential Green Finance, organized by the Smarter Project and hosted by the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Aris. I'm working as a program officer at the Copenhagen Center, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. A couple of things before we move to the main content of our webinar. Uh, this webinar is going to be about 120 minutes long, including time for Q&A at the end. The Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency conducts research and advisory activities in the fields of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. In case you cannot stay until the end or want to get back to our presentations, all the materials and the recording of the whole webinar will be available online in a few days on the Copenhagen Center's knowledge management system. Now, before we start discussing our today's webinar, I would like to inform our attendees that we comply with the General Data Protection Act, also known as GDPR. This means that your personal data, such as name, email, workplace, is, et cetera, is safely processed and stored, and all of your rights pursuant to the GDPR are respected. You have full access to the data being processed about you, and, and at any time, you can request that inaccurate data be deleted or rectified. For access or further information, please contact the people that are presented here. Finally, I would like to inform that you can send us your questions during the presentations using the dedicate icon, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. Please do not forget to mention the name of the panelist that the question is for. And now I would like to introduce the first speaker of the webinar, Talia. Good afternoon, and thanks for inviting me to introduce Smarter in this very interesting webinar today. My name is Talia Brun, and I work for CINA, the Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency of the European Commission. And at CINEA, we manage uh, different funding programs, but amongst them, uh, there is the energy efficiency part of Horizon 2020. It was back in 2018 when, uh, um, under this part of the program, uh, Smarter was selected and became part of a large family of projects that are aiming at enhancing energy efficiency. In particular, Smarter belongs to a cohort of projects that uh, aimed really at establishing innovative financing mechanisms and also at mainstreaming energy efficiency investments for financial institutions. So these are projects that basically develop tools to enhance the trust of private investors for sustainable energy investments. Um, as you will know, um, in its energy and climate packages, the European Union defined ambitious targets for the reduction of greenhouse gases and also the increased use of energy, uh, of renewable energy and the increase of energy efficiency for 2030. And, and with the European Green Deal and, and with the climate law, those objectives uh, were increased um, to um, uh, at least 55% of GHG reductions for 2030 and climate neutrality by 2050. So reaching those very ambitious uh, targets will require um, uh, unprecedented investments. Uh, it's estimated that it will be ar around 260 billion a year by 2030 of which a significant share will have to be devoted to increase the energy efficiency of buildings. And, and the figures are impressive. And so financing is recognized as, as, as a key uh, part of the transition. Um, it's necessary to reduce the existing investment gap between what we should be investing annually and what we are actually investing. And it is very clear for, for all stakeholders, I think that public funds will not be enough to bridge this gap. Hence, um, it is very key uh, to facilitate and enhance private sector investments. And it is in this context that Smarter is a very interesting project because it aims at creating demand for green finance and attract private investments uh, into buildings that meet energy efficiency standards, uh, ambitious ones, but also quality, general quality standards and environmental standards. It was the project was really set out to deliver operational, self-sustaining green homes and green mortgage programs. I think Stephen and his colleagues will tell us a lot about those uh, later today. But but I think that the relevance of, of the project has even become uh, uh, more prominent. It's it's even more obvious today after the publication of the EU taxonomy, uh, which gives very clear guidance to banks and investors on what type of homes can be considered sustainable. And Smarter really has the potential to develop a large portfolio of taxonomy uh, compliant assets and then uh, that way basically contribute to greening uh, the mortgage markets. Um, 
Well, finally, before I before I pass on the floor to to the project team, um, I wanted to mention that the European Union will continue to support projects that develop innovative financing solutions to achieve energy efficiency targets. Um, in the years to come, it will be done through the Clean Energy Transition pro sub program that has just been created under the the umbrella of the Life program. The clean energy part of this program will will have one billion uh, euro investment uh, it has a budget of 1 billion euro for the next seven years and basically the key objective of this uh, program is really to to focus on the market and regulatory enabling conditions for the clean energy transition so there is a strong focus on the non-technological aspects um, it is under life uh, CET uh, that we hope to extend uh, to, to continue supporting uh, projects uh, like Smarter, um, uh, projects that increase the demand for green finance and, and also deliver good buildings and ambitious renovations. Um, so with that, I, I let you, I, I pass on the floor to the, to the Smarter Consortium and, and thanks very much. I hope you, you all have a very fruitful webinar today. Thank you very much, Talia. I would like to give the floor to Steve from the Romanian Green Building Council, also the project manager. So, so first of all, I wanted to say a big thank you uh, to the European Commission for their support. Beyond the uh, grant funding, this was obviously very essential to help us build out the tools and, and work with what is now uh, a, a, very, a larger number of countries uh, than we set out. But all of the, the things beyond the funding, many, many opportunities were presented for us to, to get our message out. So we appreciate that. And also to all our project team uh, and, and to you, the, the listener, we appreciate your, your time today. Just uh, very briefly, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how the basic green homes and green mortgage programs work in the different markets, some of the rationale. Uh, and we have other speakers uh, to talk about many details. Just I want to start with a few extremes. This, this is obviously uh, one extreme of a type of building site. Uh, let's call it an unprofessional building site that has a, a challenge. And this, this can be found in various forms and in various degrees in, in many of the countries. Uh, this site you can see is uh, uh, disorganized. The, the, the materials, perhaps not the best materials, they're exposed to the elements. Uh, maybe it's done with friends and family to produce. And what we're really missing here is uh, proper financing, proper management of the project. And we can take this farther. Here's you know, the electrics, which uh, have a fire safety uh, component, you know, just many things that, that really can disrupt uh, having a, a good a house that's really could potentially be damaged before the house even uh, even uh, be, is occupied. Uh, on the other extreme, uh, this is one of our first certified projects uh, in the north of Bucharest. A really fantastic project, a near passive house project. Just for perspective, this house we calculated saves the equivalent of two to three mortgage payments of energy savings uh, per year uh, relative to similar homes in that area. So you can imagine uh, from a just from a financial point of view, uh, it's like paying nine to 10 mortgage payments per year instead of 12. So this is this is really the other extreme and this requires uh, upfront investment. So what we look at is really responsible borrowing versus poor construction. And we've said many times in this project, we believe the financial sector really can be the heroes of our next level of sustainability that we need to reach. It requires, we don't want people to borrow more than they can afford or to, for things they, 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 they can't afford, uh, but we also want them to build houses. This is one of their, often their most important asset or one of their most significant assets. And of course, those of us in the building industry, and I think everybody knows there's only one good time to invest in building a home properly. And of course, that's at the beginning. Uh, so this is exactly what we do. A lot of times we have long-term benefits uh, and maybe it's difficult to get people to invest today if the benefits come over time. So if we can turn those into immediate benefits, then uh, we have a, a, a good offer. Monthly investments becoming uh, monthly benefits. Uh, this, is, uh, this is exactly what the mortgage does. The investment in design and construction to provide uh, the financial quality and environmental benefits uh, those are paid for by the mortgage, by the bank, uh, and the, the cost of those are spread out over the life of the mortgage. So this really uh, 
reduces the cost immediately. And we'll talk about a little bit in more detail in, in just a moment, but this is really an enabling factor. Another very important yet obvious point, for those with, um, uh, the, there's the total cost of, of monthly ownership, which is what we really wanna emphasize, uh, is really what people actually pay to live in a home. Surely the mortgage payment is the most significant, uh, but uh, man, many know that one of the most uh, significant reasons for bankruptcy or losing a house uh, through uh, mortgage foreclosure uh, can be a personal health or the health of a loved one. Where, and as we can see in this pandemic, I mean, it's, it's very clear what, what it's not only costly, but it also disrupts uh, earning uh, power. Energy cost, uh, many of the countries in our consortium may have lower nominal energy costs, but as a percentage of income, uh, they're some of the highest cost in Europe. And, and here locally in Romania, we, we just had a, a very large increase uh, in the cost of, of LNG or gas uh, and, and more to follow. Repair cost, another significant issue. If you're a bank and you own, you co-own the asset with your borrower for 15, 20, 30 years, uh, you want to make sure it's properly thermal insulated, but also hydro insulated uh, as water infiltration and freezing and unfreezing uh, can really destroy a building of just many, many different things uh, that can come up. So, again, all of these, I think, are obvious points, but this is exactly what uh, the mortgage facilitates. I talked, uh, we, we mentioned we talk a little bit about some of the trends uh, in green finance that are driving this. And uh, my colleague Ted has a, a great um, uh, list of articles and everything on our Green Homes investment platform, uh, which you can connect to. So I'm not going to go into too much details on this, but many things. Uh, there's the, the Task Force for Climate Related flight, Financial Disclosures, Sustainable Development Goals, Actions of the European Central Bank, Paris Agreement, Taxonomy, we'll talk about. Just many, many things. Uh, anyone who's been following it knows it's it's basically a fire trying to drink from a fire hose uh, all of the information. So a lot of uh, uh, progress uh, from regulators, from national uh, uh, central banks, national banks. This is a very important one: the the network for greening the financial system. Central banks, many of our partner countries, uh, their central banks have joined this this partnership among central banks that emphasize the importance of uh, stating climate risk appropriately in your financials and, and having a uh, product line available uh, to mitigate those risks. Taxonomy will go into more details a little later, but I just, just to say very, very simply, uh, if we look to the, really the left uh, part of this, that the climate change mitigation is the carbon reduction, the energy efficiency, uh, introducing green energy. But importantly, there's all of the other sides, which I can happily report. Uh, we as Green Building Councils and, and our various expert organizations, we've been working on the non-energy green criteria. And we'll talk about why that's so important, because the taxonomy basically states you should mitigate carbon emissions, uh, but do no significant harm uh, to, to uh, the other very essential uh, parts uh, that, that projects could impact. This uh, very briefly is a, is a summary of what our various partners have in their certification, the different things that we look at. On the far left, energy efficiency, green energy, as I mentioned, is a critical part, uh, but many others. And, and I'm going to come back to this in, in just a second. When we've talked with our banking partners and also even some soon to be banking partners, uh, a lot of questions are out there. You know, how do you monitor a green project. Um, is it credible? Do we know that we actually will get a green uh, project if uh, if we work under a particular program? Green washing is always a concern, uh, and that's something um, that, that we have to look at. Complexity. We as organizations, we spend basically uh, all of our days uh, discussing how to certify a building. Is it green or not green? So it is a very complex question. And I'm happy to report that I think we've got some great answers and we, we have basically an open source approach to work with many of the, the great certification systems out there to provide the market flexibility on which certification they, they approach. But at the same time, we check which are being used and how they're being done to assure the bank partners uh, that, that the, the answer we give about eligibility for a particular project is correct. Taxonomy alignment. If, if portfolios 
uh, are being sold on uh, to the market for institutional investors or, or um, other purchasers that, that it's very important now that, that they will start to be aligned with the EU taxonomy for sustainable finance. Deal flow, another question we get is, if we start this program, will there be customers? And I will show a few slides on that. Short answer, yes, there are. And this, uh, I think anyone's following the green market and, and uh, activities with, uh, with, with what the EU is leading on, uh, we can expect that this is only uh, going to uh, rapidly increase. Other questions like how do you value properly a, a green market? Uh, that I came up with about 15 sort of main areas and I concluded we have about about 13 answers for 15 of the of the main concerns and uh, we won't cover them all today but uh, the good news I think I feel very confident that we have all the tools available one of the really exciting things too uh, th this is some some slides about just the cost aspect uh, often we are told that you know green may cost more but when we really look at it we have to look at the reference building and the particular developer or investor who's telling us it's much more, uh, they may be looking at it using a poor quality reference building and even a non-compliant reference building. So when we look at compliance, we find that the gap of, of green versus non-green uh, falls significantly. Also with the NZEB legislation, this is really a fantastic tool for us because it pushes all of the market for all building types uh, that they must make uh, the energy investments. Energy efficiency and green energy, no doubt about it. To do things properly, you need uh, very good solutions, so materials, you need talent, you need uh, time to do it, to design it properly. This costs money. I, I still think it's, uh, to my first point, it's, it's often uh, very close to what you have to do to build a quality building anyway. But, but this is basically leveling the playing field. And what I'll show you uh, uh, through the, the next couple of slides is that a lot of the other non-energy green, uh, they don't cost, or they, co they can even cost less before the project's done. What we say in our training and, and working over the years is this is really about thinking, uh, thinking more, not spending more. And I think you'll see, and, and you probably have seen in, in some of your better projects that you've witnessed, uh, that this is indeed the case. And when we compare capital expenditures and we hope to get those back in reduced operating expenditures, this has been a discussion. You know, the payback period, if you put solar panels on a building, when do you get your money uh, in return? Uh, the, the good news, I, and I can show you, it's really about trading cost in your budget line of a project and that those costs actually often uh, 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 can just replace others. And we're also looking very much to shift people away from the sales price of their home. And depending on the market, people are focused very much on the absolute sales price of the home rather than the ownership uh, cost. So the, uh, a focus on first cost rather than future cost. And just to maybe iter reiterate or emphasize my point a little bit more about uh, the cost of green buildings, uh, this is Romania's uh, fourth solar decathlon team. Uh, they, uh, this is a very prestigious, uh, uh, building contest. They were first, uh, sorry, uh, third in Europe uh, with the overall contest in a very competitive field from all around Europe, but they were first in having the lowest budget. So they did really a fantastic project and creativity, as they say, begins when you remove a zero from your budget uh, and they can do it. And their average age is probably 20, 22 years old. Uh, so the rest of the market can do it. And just coming back just to some very brief examples, um, if we look, for example, construction waste mit mitigation, that second point, and, and circular economy principles, there is a construction waste directive in place. And really what we found is building projects, once they learn how to separate waste, uh, it's really um, uh, not a cost increase. They usually just pass this to their waste management company, uh, set out different, different bins for different things, and, and it's a bit tra about training and compliance. Uh, just one example, there's uh, gypsum that can be 100% from recycled gypsum with no cost uh, if collected properly. Um, other things uh, like indoor air quality, this was be important before the pandemic, obviously important now, uh, and it can be controlled by thoughtful ventilation and uh, use of materials. Uh, 
Other things like location doesn't change. If it's a green building, generally most, most uh, projects uh, prefer to have good uh, uh, public transit connectivity, walkability, et cetera. And what we call bioclimatic design, uh, we have a whole course on this, but just you can imagine if you shade a building properly and you use proper sol solar orientation software properly, you can often uh, spend a little bit more on shading and a little bit more on design and pay less for the air conditioning and heating of the building, uh, depending. You're letting the natural sun do the work for you or, or, or to be blocked uh, to prevent it from being a problem. So these are just examples, again, that, that they, they save money before the project is done. We have a ton of materials for our banking partners. Uh, this is on the left is uh, some of the, the more interesting uh, uh, points that we make about uh, green buildings and, and to help sell to the citizens. And on the right is a toolkit. We have one for banks, for developers, for companies. Uh, full details of all that I'm talking about today uh, and uh, in, a, in a wide array. I'm gonna be very quick here. This is also, again, in that toolkit, but basically the bank lowers their risk by having a, a uh, uh, by financing a green home, uh, and in return, that lower uh, financing cost uh, allows the developer to invest critically in the design and construction. The home buyer on the bottom right gets the benefits of lower cost and a better quality home, and uh, the certifier, the top right green uh, area, uh, we get as environmental organizations. Uh, we get compliance and uh, and and really a, a, a we provide assurance to the bank to uh, to make sure that it's done done correctly I should say uh, talk as talk as deal flow this is a number uh, that's been growing rapidly and I and this is really just now starting to increase with all of uh, the new countries that have joined so we expect this to go up um, about twenty one thousand homes. Uh, have been uh, certified or in the process of uh, certification, what we call pre-certified, uh, for about 3.125 uh, billion euros of project value. You can increase that by about 15, 16% uh, for US dollars, uh, just for comparison. But this, it, I could, obviously this, this uh, for the number of homes around the world being built, this is a small amount, uh, but by no means are we a niche uh, anymore. Just this is a multifamily successful project uh, that in Bucharest uh, that sold very successfully. We're now certifying the next one. Uh, here's a single family home in Bosnia that's being uh, uh, certified under our our program. Uh, and now I want to talk about uh, Raiffeisen Bank was our first partner in Romania to join us. And I'm just going to just kind of give a quick demonstration of how this is working uh, in general. Uh, this is uh, uh, a very simple format that I've, that I've reduced to, to for simplicity here. But uh, if we look at the home on the left, the, this EPCB, which let's call it a standard home, uh, and compare it to the one on the right, which is one that has gone through our certification, we can see a difference in sales price. The, the, the green certified does cost more, and it allows that allows the budget. Uh, the loan is higher on the on the right side because of the higher sales price. Uh, but the monthly mortgage payment due to the discounted financing is lower uh, and, and or is, is, let's say, roughly equal, we could say. But then, of course, when we add in the energy cost, the story changes and the green home becomes cheaper per month. And when we talk about, again, is green expensive or not, um, I would ask people to compare those two numbers and say which one is cheaper. And that's available from from month one. Uh, Alpha Bank also joined us, um, did a national television campaign uh, across the country. Uh, we're pleased to have Libra uh, Internet Bank uh, also launching a program, and uh, both for retail mortgages and uh, for developers who achieve our certification. Uh, other partners, uh, Becere, which is the Erste Group affiliate in, uh, in Romania, uh, the Home Building Finance of Ireland, Benepe Paribas and Boss Bank in Poland, a guarantee bank BBVA. Uh, so we're very pleased to have them join. Those those three mystery banks on the bottom are actually ones that uh, we're uh, signing partnerships with, but uh, too early to announce. Uh, but we intend, or we will announce uh, very shortly, uh, some more partnerships across across our implementing partner countries. 
with that, I would say thank you. And um, we'll, again, have questions at, at uh, the end. And um, I will turn it over uh, to our uh, project colleague and also the chair of our European Advisory Board, uh, Ms. Moretta Willem peterson Thank you very much, Stephen, for, for this very, uh, very impressive and convincing uh, rundown. Now, um, who exactly are we? I mean, uh, the Smarter Project as such, and you heard Talia talk about it in the beginning and how this was, was born. Um, basically, uh, we are, of course, a number of countries, a number of partners who are engaged in this project. As you can see here in the map, you, you will see some of the countries. You, you heard very much from Stephen's story that, uh, that this is uh, also a lot of the story that has been born in Romania by the Romanian uh, Green Building Council. But uh, Stephen and colleagues in Romania came together with a number of other European countries and created this project from the onset. Where we are now is that we actually have 18 countries engaged. We're covering a total number of citizens exceeding 870 million people, which is quite a, a large number of people that are all of them, of course, either in homes or in need of a home and, and with a great potential. Europe was the start, as you can see, but we are also now engaging much beyond Europe. You can see Colombia there, Brazil, Morocco, Indonesia on the map. And we welcome also all of you who are in this call today, who are also going beyond Europe, where the born, the birth of Smarter took place. This is the consortium. So as you can see there, we have uh, GPC, Green Building Council, uh, Brazil also there who is now actively working with several commercial banks to design special green financing products. We also have, uh, we also have sorry, uh, the, um, the, the Colombian Green Building Council joining, and they are actually launching their program on the, the 28th of October. So that's in a month from now or so. And, and we have uh, a number of other um, green building councils engaged in, in this process. But I also want to underline that it's not just green building councils that we are reaching out to. We are right, reaching out to any institutions who are ready to engage in the process of Smarter, in, in the roadmap of Smarter. So what is this project really about and, and what have we done inside this project financed by the European Commission? So you, you will see here on the, on the left-hand side that we have done a number of uh, uh, research pieces and, uh, and quite a lot of analytical work to try to understand really what is the market, what are the barriers, where are the, the opportunities, etc. So research has been a key uh, priority in this, uh, in this project. Then, of course, we have done what we call here preparation, but that will imply a lot of those tools that, for instance, have been successfully used in Romania has been applied now and translated and adapted to other country contexts. And we continue to do that, as I will show in a minute. These tools and these methodologies are then applied in an implementation in all of these countries that are engaged where the work on certification, on engaging with banks and making agreement with banks, with developers, etc., is taking place. And then, of course, we are looking at replication. We feel we have a very strong and successful story in, in Europe, and we want to bring that to, to other countries who want to replicate it and make it even stronger and bring it to, to uh, the entire world. Now, when we look at the timeline, you can see some of the key uh, milestones that we have been have been in this uh, in this process, and one of them, the March 2020 milestone, was the European Advisory Board that I am honored to chair, and I will talk a little bit about that later. But otherwise, the flow of the timeline really follows very nicely the uh, uh, project uh, design, and and so we are progressing naturally and growing naturally. And that expansion and thinking about that expansion of Smarter, going to additional European countries, going to emerging economies in Asia and Latin America and Africa, where does that come from? That comes, of course, from having a strong uh, family of, of uh, Smarter uh, stakeholders and, and uh, partners in Europe, but also bringing it to those emerging economies that are facing a growing middle class with a strong attention both to to 
building for and, and, and planning for long term and making sure that their houses are are considering air, indoor air pollution, health aspects, also addressing, of course, climate change environment and having that ambition and, and, and thinking about energy security, of course, and, and green finance, not least, as we are talking to banks, because green finance is, of course, the core of this. And we see in, in emerging economies in these uh, parts of the world, all of that comes together. And there's really a need and a wish and a demand to uh, to have a green residential uh, sector that is really scaled to the demands of society. And what do we have to offer? We have, of course, the roadmap. How have we done it in in the context of Europe? What are all those elements that uh, that will take you down that road and and lead you to the to the goal? And we have a lot of lessons learned, experiences to build upon, which also makes us believe that it, the the onboarding of new partners uh, can happen much more easily. And then, of course, it's about gaining a commitment and, and launching uh, pilot programs, launching it with a number of uh, potential partners. I mentioned it's not just green building councils. We are also happy to launch with financial institutions, other types of institutions, intermediates, developers, etc., that has a wish to, to embark upon this. And we have a whole range of documents. Uh, you see here some of the translated documents for the European market, uh, but as I also have on the bottom right hand side there are a number of toolkits available both for those who are uh, providers or developers for financial institutions we have sample legal agreements for how to certify and have institutions that are credible as certifiers we have catalogs of a variety of, of barriers and opportunities as we see it as i mentioned we have done a lot of research on this and, and we have uh, legal agreements also for how to do these products uh, on the shelf. So a lot of material that has been developed as part of Smarter that we believe can really successfully be replicated and upscaled to the rest of the world. Now, we have, of course, been faced with the, the pandemic like everybody else. Here you see some nice pictures of back from the era where we could meet. And in some countries, we are indeed able to meet again. But we are also doing a lot more, uh, both in terms of webinars such as this one, uh, other types of events, etc. We have a lot of uh, news work taking place and, and blogs and podcasts, etc. And you can tap into all of that uh, as a financial intermediate uh, if you want to know more. And we have, uh, as uh, was also mentioned up front in this Copenhagen Center of Energy Efficiency, we have platforms that you can access in a specific platform for 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 financial uh, stakeholders that we will talk about a little later. Now, I want to be, move quickly to the, the fact that we are also addressing uh, not just, uh, as I said, the, the emerging middle class that has demands, but also the, the aspect of just transition and energy poverty. And so we have an element of this as well, where we are signing up uh, a, a range of uh, municipalities who are committing themselves to work on uh, getting also uh, addressing also the energy poverty aspect and making sure that the houses are for all income groups. And then finally, I want to come to our our core issue here in this presentation. We have the European Advisory Board, and that has been a tremendous support in throughout the the project of Smarter. Uh, all of these uh, prominent people listening here, maybe hopefully some of them already online as well now. We have selected those because of their specific niche and, and contribution in the, in the market, you can say, or in the area of uh, green residential finance. We have finance institutions there. We have UN there. We have uh, a, a multilateral development bank, uh, institutional investors, other types of in the, uh, uh, intermediates, etc. And I think uh, those, have, those persons have really been a, a supportive uh, rock for us when we have gone through this. They are appointed in their personal capacity. They are experts with this outstanding knowledge and expertise. And we have been tapping into that uh, because they have been committed to discuss with us, to provide us advice and to, to ask us the critical questions, the devil's advocates question, etc. And we have sought advice on a variety of challenges. But most importantly, we have now uh, towards the the, the end of the European Union finance made sure that the EIB has, has supported us by endorsing what we call the minimum standards and the policy recommendations. 
that are the centerpiece of Smarter and which are what we will bring to you as financial stakeholders and to the rest of the world. And with this, I will hand over to my colleagues. I will hand over to Marki Khalif from the Green Building Council in Italia and uh, Ted Kronmiller, who's an advisor to Smarter. And both of them will talk about these particular pieces, the minimum standards and the policy recommendations. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. I am uh, Marco Caffi, the director of Green Building Council Italia and one of the Green Building Councils that are participating to this project. And I try to share now with my presentation some talk about how Smarter and uh, the proposal of Smarter could be an instrument for the growth of the green finance for the residential sector. First of all, okay, we know that uh, we have uh, a, our sector must uh, find a way to participate to the decarbonization of our economy. And we have a different uh, way to arrive, but uh, we have to define a, a curve of the decarbonization of the sector that uh, we can choose one way, but we have to meet the, a, a, a goal until 2050. So if you look at the graph of the on the right so and the green line the green curve represent our uh, decarbonization path okay and the black the current emission of existing building what uh, uh, we need is that the new building or the building that we have to renovate must arrive to the performance it must guarantee performance that are strong under the decarbonization part. And we must be sure that this performance will uh, will bring the will will um, will be uh, in line with the long term objective. Because uh, this is the green line that uh, you can see horizontal green line that uh, if you build a new house that have low emission, you will not cross the green curve that represents our decarbonization path. If you invest in the right, right way uh, in the new house, maybe you can have a house that uh, will have a not good performance that uh, at what time, at determined time, it cross the, the line of the our decarbonization path. And so that means that uh, this building will, will have a, a extra emission that uh, means extra cost. And the extra cost means that uh, maybe the customer will not able to uh, refund the, the, the loan. But this is not the only one risk that we have. We have uh, some other risk. The risk is that uh, the house that we uh, build, the new house or the, the house that we uh, renovate, don't maintain the performance during the, the its life. So uh, you can see if we, okay, after the, for the new house arrive to a good performance of the uh, uh, carbon emission, okay, this graph represent the the graph on the left represent uh, on the um, emission carbon emission during different years after the the new construction and. Uh, they, uh, if the new house don't uh, maintain the performance, it will be it will arrive a year where the performance of the house will uh, cross the decarbonization path. So that means that we will have extra cost, and this is another time a risk for the customer and for the bank that uh, give the mortgage to to the to the customer. There is another thing that we have to consider that the durability and the resilience must be taken into account. Because if we have a house that okay is compliant with our um, objective about the uh, carbon emission, but is not designed uh, with a durable and resilience concept, maybe could be that an intensive event. For example, a big storm could break the uh, could break something could uh, make the performance of the building uh, less uh, high, and so the the building return to 
cross the line of the decarbonization path, and so that means extra cost for the customer. So how Smarter try to help to manage this risk? Which two uh, two tools uh, uh, we can say two tools? One is define what is a green house and uh, define in which way you can measure the sustainability of a building. And in Smarter we define we have defined rating system dedicated for certified the sustainability of uh, a house in order to um, achieve all um, um, all the value that uh, a sustainable building represents. So not only energy efficiency, but also a house that is more uh, health and uh, a house that uh, also saves not energy, but also water, a house where uh, the material that is uh, used uh, are a low uh, environmental impact. And in general, a house that is more durable and resilient to the uh, change that uh, in, during his life, its life could happen. And uh, the second point is that uh, this rating system is a part of the green mortgage pr process that we define. So a third certification body, the third part that manages the decertification can certify the process of the, the design and the construction process and the results. So in this way, the bank that give the, the mortgage to the customer are sure that the process and the quality of the construction meet the resilience uh, goals, the durability goals, and uh, uh, the uh, environmental uh, imp low environmental impact. And uh, that means that. Uh, a, a house that is designed and uh, constructed and built in uh, using these tools also is able to satisfy the taxonomy request. So you know that uh, taxonomy has uh, six environmental objectives, but uh, very important is that taxonomy uh, introduces also the concept of uh, do not uh, the do not significant harm. So that means that if you uh, want to uh, achieve one object, like for example the climate change that optimize the energy efficiency, you don't have to uh, create any significant harm, for example, to transition to a circular economy. That means that you must have a holistic approach to the design and construction of the house and the rating system that we uh, con uh, connect to the uh, mortgage is uh, uh, the tool that uh, uh, helps to do this. And what what means this? It, it means that uh, if you build a house with this uh, uh, approach, then also thanks to the levers, the common framework uh, developed by the European Commission, it's possible to share data about the performance with other and compare house that are uh, designed and built with uh, some other rating system. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the bank that uh, operates not only in one country can compare the sustainability uh, result of different uh, uh, buildings. That means that uh, yeah, using these tools also help to have buildings that can produce easily a lot of data about the environmental behavior of the building. That means that we can report more easy the uh, connection between the uh, sustainability of the building and the uh, taxonomy uh, objectives. And in this way to uh, report the uh, ESG value of the investment and uh, connect uh, all the uh, financial uh, process to the uh, sustainable goals. So uh, we think that uh, uh, for this reason, combine the certification and a right uh, process of for the mortgage, uh, we, we think that could be possible to support the growth of the green finance in the residential sector. But now I, I let the stage to, to tell that it will explain better and it will present uh, more data about it. Good afternoon, everyone. Ted Cronmiller. I'm glad to be here to discuss, to discuss key policy initiatives to support the growth of green residential finance and drive high ambitions of environmental performance. We are going to discuss policy recommendations that 
are going to focus on the convergence of international and EU climate goals, number one. Number two, real estate portfolio performance um, in terms of environmental risk and financial risk. And three, uh, systemic risk. So um, with that, we uh, to, to kind of to kind of frame up um, the discussion here, we know that we've got um, we know that, you know, uh, we have um, we know that we have big challenges that we face. So the um, we have studies from international, national and regional banking supervisors, policymakers and oversight bodies that acknowledge that climate risk is a source of systemic risk. It has the potential to destabilize the banking sector and the financial system. Uh, climate risk can impact banks through loan exposures to properties, projects, and portfolios, which are themselves are subject to, to high degrees of physical and, and transition risk. So the European Central Bank recently performed an economy-wide stress test to understand the exposure of euro area, area banks to climate risk under different temperature scenarios and future climate policies. So I'm going to briefly kind of summarize um, what the uh, ECB and many, um, you know, many, many um, policymakers have kind of acknowledged here. So what we're looking at here on the left side, um, just to kind of frame this up a little bit, the, there's, this was an analysis of 1,600 banks that looked at the physical and transmission, uh, physical and transition risk transmission channels and looked at climate risk drivers under different climate scenarios and macroeconomic conditions. Um, basically, what they did in the stress test is um, they broke down the exposure across the sector uh, and across different asset classes. And basically, they found that the short-term costs of transition are surpassed by the benefits of a net zero financial sector, real estate sector, and overall economy. So what we're looking at on the left-hand side here, at the top left-hand um, uh, chart, is a composition of the euro area banking system. Uh, and they broke it down bet uh, between what they call less significant institutions and significant institutions. Really, all institutions are significant, but what they're talking about here are uh, smaller regional banks and larger um, systemic uh, banks. And they have uh, they broke down the exposure to climate risk. And basically, most um, the smaller banks have a lower share of exposure, um, and the larger banks um, are less than 10% of the number of banks, but have about 80% of exposure, which is double the share of high transition and physical risk relative to smaller banks. So, uh, just to give um, um, some perspective geographically, um, you know, France and Belgium have a high concentration of, you know, uh, of the banking sector is highly consolidated and there's a lot of ex exposure to physical and transition risk. And Austria and Germany, uh, for example, on the other end of the spectrum, have a larger share of exposure held by smaller banks. So th when we just drop down to the um, next chart on the left hand side. We look at the share of bank loans exposed to transition and physical risk by credit of country. Um, a lot of this, a lot of the physical risk, for example, is concentrated in countries like Greece, Cyprus, Portugal, Spain, and Malta. On the right-hand side, we're looking at um, we're looking at transition risk. At the top right-hand side, uh, we're looking. And so, for example, what the ECB is telling us through the stress test is that um, the top ten polluting countries correspond to 30 percent of overall. Uh, port, the top ten most polluting portfolios contribute to 30% of the overall, and they finance 60% of scope one, two, and three emissions on an absolute basis. And um, 65 credit portfolios representing 4% of the sample uh, account for 20% of the exposure and finance 45% of the emissions. And these are located in Italy, France, and Germany. So at the bottom right-hand side, we're looking at physical risk. Um, so this kind of this is kind of a look. This is kind of a um, kind of a macro level look at the European banking system and their exposure to physical and transition risk, which is, much of this can come from the real estate sector. So knowing this, what do we do about it? Um, well, we know that environmental sustainability and economic outcomes are mutually inclusive and self-reinforcing objectives. So through the uh, Smarter Consortium, we have recommended a set of policy initiatives, um, some which adapt um, existing EU policies and some which are um, have been developed in-house by Smarter. Um, Smarter's taken a close look at the climate scenario analysis uh, capabilities. And what we've done is on the left hand side of the screen here, you know, we can we kind of summarize um, how climate risk translates into macroeconomic risk factors um, at a, a macro level and a micro level and also translates into financial system risks. Um, so that's kind of a kind of an overview of that. Um, and 
then we so what we've done is we've taken climate modeling exercises and and we've we've we can we can use those to inform policy recommendations from top down modeling exercises that look at um, that look at the impact of climate conditions on macroeconomic conditions like GDP, inflation, employment, house prices. And financial sector conditions like yield curve shifts, OAS spreads, bond prices, loan level valuations. So um, we can look at how physical and transition outcomes affect these risk types and how central banks can use this information to address specific areas of risk and monitor uh, key risk indicators. What we've also done is we've looked at a bottom up scenario analysis where financial institutions can take things like sort of the performance data from a smarter certification and look at the alignment of their loan level feature to the risk profiles of um, sustainable, you know, of, um, of, their, of their portfolio. So they can um, financial institutions can take environmental performance data and align the product sets to um, to to low degrees of environmental risk. Um, with so on the on the left hand side, what we've done here is we took a property portfolio and we projected out the um, primary energy demand um, out to 2050. So this was based on the 20 on the 2020 NGFS scenarios. They had eight scenarios. They've come out with new scenarios in 2021, which we've taken a look at, um, and those uh, those scenarios are. Um, are on the right hand side and just just to summarize two extreme scenarios when we have our current policies uh, not extreme scenarios but on one end of the spectrum we have our current policies which you can see on one of those graphs there and then we have our net zero by 2050 and then we have uh, four other scenarios so um, so basically what these scenarios tell us is that we need deep reductions in carbon intensity to reach net zero carbon emissions by uh, by 2050. So just to give, uh, to provide a sense of the types of international and European institutions that are using climate scenario analysis, we have 95 central banks that are part of the network for greening the financial system, the bank for international settlements, which is kind of a, some, uh, a bank to central banks, uh, over five development banks, uh, including, you know, the European Investment Bank. Um, we have the uh, United Nations Environmental Program, is, is using climate scenario analysis, Bank of France, uh, Bank of England, credit rating agencies are using these. Um, and we have, uh, for example, some, some, uh, private, some other private sector providers like MSCI, they look at things like climate value at risk. So what we do with, uh, with these tools is we use these to inform policies. So with that, um, one of the policies that we've recommended in-house that we've kind of developed in-house here at Smarter is um, is what we call the EU taxonomy aligned climate risk weighted assets. So w what we do is we've taken a concept like a climate risk weighted asset calculation that has, uh, and we link that to the EU taxonomy. So risk weighted assets is a driver of a risk based capital. And what we do is we link the key, um, we link the EU policy objectives to bank regulatory capital and we take the eu we take the um eu technical screening criteria for climate change mitigation and the do no significant harm and we basically take each one of those and we multiply them by your baseline risk weighted assets to get a climate adjusted rwa and what this does is it translates environmental performance and do cross risk reduction at a property project and portfolio level and what it means is the as the degree of environmental ambition um, of underlying properties increases, RWA will proportionally decrease. So it will incentivize the banking sector to adopt voluntary standards and promote reduction in environmental and energy consumption and environmental impact. Um, it'll, it can allow banks to design product sets that capture the metrics and thresholds outlined in climate change mitigation technical screening criteria and do no significant assessment harm criteria for new construction, renovation, and ownership and acquisition activities. So the reductions in RWA can in turn increase the balance sheet capacity of banks and stimulate sustainable real estate finance as environmental ambition increases. Um, and what this is really this is really important. It's a big priority for um, EU policymakers as the European Banking Authority um, actually notified the European Commission that it wants to incorporate ESG factors into the EU directive on prudential requirements for credit institutions in 
and investment firms. So what this what this means is uh, a bank can kind of take a proactive measure in, in taking the metrics from the EU taxonomy, integrate those into the risk-based capital framework, and demonstrate to the to not only regulators but also the also the, the capital markets that they are they're integrating environmental sustainability. So um, the, uh, the the European Commission is taking recommendations on this up until 2025, where they want to kind of incorporate this into the renewed sustainable finance strategy. So we are recommending that this is a policy initiative that the EU taxonomy be linked to um, to the to risk based capital frameworks. So um, the EBA has acknowledged that um, beneficial capital treatment is, for green real estate is a priority. And and by banks taking um, the first step on this, it's more likely that that will happen. So. Um, to uh, another recommendation that we have made in house here at Smarter is the environmental uh, the uh, environmental performance coefficient. So what this does is it calibrates um, financial products and transition structures, uh, transaction structures to um, to to environmental performance. Uh, so the environmental performance coefficient was developed to link. Um, all the performance data we get from the uh, smarter certification and that we gather from policy implementation uh, into implement that into the underwriting process. And what it does is it eliminates transition risk by being um, current with by being aligned with current policies like the EU taxonomy and the green bond standard, reduces physical risk and facilitates cross risk reduction across over 10 risk uh, financial risk types. It provides protection against greenwashing. It enables systemic allocation of resources to projects meeting regulatory and investor-driven sustainable sustainability criteria, incentivizes EU taxonomy alignment, max, and it maximizes environmental sustainability outcomes. So without, uh, without getting too detailed on the mechanics, I just wanted to outline four methodologies that we have developed for the environmental performance coefficient. Um, one is a certification-based methodology where we look at certification systems like Smarter, the Home Performance Index, BRAM, LEED, DNG, DGMB, and HQE. We take the top two uh, categories of those rating systems and we apply, we develop a coefficient which is then applied to features of a mortgage uh, and also structured finance product uh, to a feature of a mortgage, to a uh, feature of a construction loan, and to uh, structured finance product sets. So we've done this for, we've taken, uh, we have a methodology based on the EU um, EU taxonomy, climate change mitigation, and do no significant harm criteria. We have another one. Uh, the third methodology is the eco-financial risk-based methodology, which basically takes risk reduction across climate risk and other categories of financial risk and adjusts uh, financial product sets accordingly. We then have an environmental uh, factor-based methodology, which takes the categories of environmental performance and different um, in, in certification systems and translates that into financial product reductions. So, um, so, so essentially, you know, what this does is it is it, is it, is it, is it, is it incentivizes environmental performance from the development phase of a of a home to the underwriting phase of the of the finance for the construction of the home and for the uh, for the mortgage and then and onwards into the securitization whether that be into an RMBS multifamily CMBS cover bond a palm brief or an RMBS back stacoop. Um, so some of the things that we've seen in the market here, we've seen multifamily bridge and mezzanine real estate lenders, um, you know, kind of allowing uh, sustainable real estate mortgage insurance premium reductions for properties that achieve high levels of environmental certification. And we're also seeing uh, increasingly international and European banks offering discounted mortgage rates. So what this does is this helps banks meet the objectives, uh, policymaker objectives, and it helps them uh, meet and, sh and and it provides um, it provides uh, incentives for higher levels of environmental performance. So with all this, um, we can design uh, we can design green real estate finance product sets that maximize environmental impact and financial performance. These product these products um, span many of the products that we have that I previously mentioned from acquisition, development, construction loans, to mortgages and renovation loans, to different types of structured finance vehicles. And 
what we've done at Smarter is we looked at over 50 types of European sustainable residential real estate projects that were evaluated under rating systems like Smarter, Lead, Bream, HQE, and we and we translated that certification criteria into um, loan level features and uh, deal uh, deal transaction features, and we kind of and we've come up with um, sort of idealized types of transactions that policymakers can use as blueprints. Um, down on the lower right-hand side of the screen here, you see um, just kind of a summary of European unsecured real estate bond issuance, which uh, you know has has kind of ebbed and flowed from between 2015 to 2021. But what we see here is ESG-related bond issuance has increased quite significantly. So just in 2021, year-to-date at mid-year 2021, outstripped uh, 2020. So there is a growing now, there's a growing priority by policymakers to integrate ESG into um, into mortgage finance. Uh, there's growing demand by institutional investors. So, you know, I think pol- policymakers, you know, would like to see, um, you know, there's this, you know, the, the policymakers would like to see things adopted at a, at a macro level and a micro level. So, for example, the um, what we're doing with the environmental performance coefficient is allowing banks to, you know, meet things like the EU taxonomy, UN SDGs. Um, at a high level and at a micro level, um, they meet green building certification criteria. So, um, you know, just anecdotally, um, the market for sustainable finance has has um, uh, has re- you know rapidly increased, and and a lot of institutional investors are seeing that increasing more. So this is becoming much more uh, a much larger priority. So with that, we have um, you know one one of the final recommendations here is. Um, has to do with the, the green bond standards, which uh, basically the EU, the impending EU green bond standard it basically proposes that any type of listed or unlisted bond or capital market debt instrument issued by a European or international issue, issuer that's aligned with the EU taxonomy can be an EU green bond. So it links the use of proceeds EU green bond to the the EU taxonomy regulations. And, and at Smarter, what we recommend is that the EU green bond standard should, number one, define what a sustainable residential real estate backed securitization or financial instrument constitutes by standardizing criteria for assessing and reporting the environmental impact of the underlying loans. Number two, it should clarify what a sustainable securitization looks like <clears throat> by, um, by standardizing criteria and assessing the environmental impact of the underlying assets. Number three, it should create a harmonized regime for development of EU sustainable securitization market and for increased bank lending capacity for sustainable residential real estate projects. Um, so uh, there's so that's so so that's kind of that's some of our key policy recommendations. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Camille. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone from Belgium. Thank you, Ted. Um, and. Um, uh, here we we enter um, a, a section of the of this webinar to make uh, zooming out uh, to contextualize and to mention some of the background um, of uh, of the work we've done in our project to sustain uh, some of the elements uh, that have been mentioned before and that uh, we will be. Um, we have been we've been supporting through uh, different uh, research work, uh, doing review surveys, data analysis, um, in and all this work is being uh, structured in um, in a series of uh, of tasks um, established from the beginning of the project, and uh, we did um, a review of uh, previous studies uh, on these topics and uh, also on the uh, codes and uh, norms for construction in every every uh, each of the implementing countries, countries. and uh, also on the cost of construction, uh, also that were mentioned at the introduction, and uh, also um, studying the, the specific context of each country um, uh, concerning the, the barriers and potentialities of uh, for implementing this program. Uh, in this presentation, I will mention some of the research, uh, the general research in the topic, and also in the construction cost of green homes. And in the in the, the following uh, two speakers of this section, we will mention the green homes valuation uh, topic, uh, uh, where we um, were producing a um, 
uh, guidelines for, for these and also the alignment strategies uh, with uh, key uh, recent uh, um, uh, policies and um, also the data structure um, for collecting data uh, coming from buildings participating in these programs. So for um, the background on, on research, on scientific uh, research on the topic, we focus on two, um, we, we um, give two categories. Uh, one, A, here, focusing uh, research papers and, and projects, focusing on energy savings and the energy efficiency aspect of buildings relating to the financial risk and the, the default risk uh, of these buildings. And uh, we, we went back uh, to you know, research even from the late 90s, uh, already um, supporting uh, this, this trend and this evidence until uh, recent or ongoing projects that um, all confirm that there is a direct uh, default risk uh, impact uh, uh, um, from the energy efficiency of, the, of a building. This is uh, kind of intuitive, uh, common sense, uh, but this is supported with uh, with the data coming from uh, from um, real projects and real uh, uh, feedback from from the ground. And uh, this uh, uh, research uh, field has uh, allowed to better evaluate the cost effectiveness of um, public policies, and uh, it is common in this. Uh, in these um, studies that uh, the, they invite to, to, to uh, consider further uh, non-energy um, uh, efficiency, uh, uh, not only energy efficiency benefits and savings in energy, but other, other uh, benefits and other criteria that is the, the second uh, um, category we, we, we analyze uh, and we review of um, studies focusing on other uh, benefits and other green building criteria uh, that uh, may relate to, to the value and to the, to the full risk of, uh, of uh, in the case of uh, mortgage projects. And uh, in these uh, projects, some examples are given here. Um, and of course, there is less um, quantity data available than um, that in the, in the energy efficiency uh, focus projects where, where uh, data can be uh, really uh, concrete uh, with uh, energy bills and energy uh, metering. Um, even, even though with, with this uh, more uh, qualitative and uh, less direct evidence, this is always confirm um, uh, this trend of, uh, uh, of having a, a positive correlation of uh, higher quality with less uh, default risk in this kind of projects and um, confirming the, the, the benefits of these uh, healthier and more comfortable homes that uh, they uh, these uh, bring to, to confirming a real um, higher real estate value that is uh, most of the time supported by by certifications uh, what about the, the for achieving this this better quality green building uh, uh, Expected higher quality. Uh, uh, it is um, for sure. It needs some some attention and some uh, upfront, upfront investment. And uh, a study, um, a recent study, uh, is using here the, the different stages of uh, of a project uh, development established by the, the RIVA. Uh, and and the different stages uh, were detailed. Where can uh, uh, Extra cost to be engaged when 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 addressing um, a green um, building higher quality project and uh, in the preliminary phases of course are the other extra studies and extra thinking and then uh, uh, different um, stages and different uh, elements where in the construction of the actual construction of the project. Uh, Extra cost can be engaged, and um, it is um, uh, as was mentioned uh, in the introduction. Also, um, this uh, extra investment cost can uh, we, we agree in a, within a, in the context of, of our project to set a, a twelve and to, 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 to mention a twelve to fifteen percent uh, extra cost 
um, but it is um, uh, a really uh, safe uh, on the on the safe side of the of the situations and considering uh, uh, situations where uh, maybe implementing countries where the experience is limited uh, in the green building construction. And uh, because research uh, shows, even from, from uh, many years ago, research is showing that um, a much lower uh, affordable situation can uh, can be um, uh, documented. And um, it is even more true nowadays with uh, the evolution of uh, the market and uh, the normal the, the building code uh, uh, requirements uh, because uh, the quality is improving by itself uh, so the, the extra cost is lowering and um, it is important to mention that uh, integrating this objective of having a green home from the beginning of a project will uh, really limit this this potential uh, uh, cost uh, premiums in the in the construction phase so uh, focusing on, on more attention and more investment in the plan design and early design uh, phases uh, will uh, ensure to, to limit this uh, potential extra cost. And um, some of the, of the decisions can even uh, represent uh, savings in the construction itself, not, not, not only in the operation. And um, really the, the good news is uh, that it's also documented from uh, early on. This is uh, from 2007 already, when when um, several projects were compared, um, uh, and uh, the, the the results here for extra cost was only of two percent, uh, while with uh, surveys, the, the 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 perception, the perceived barrier of this extra cost is uh, is much higher, of uh, 15 to 17 percent, but uh, in reality this could be uh, much lower. Um, so those two are just some examples of, uh, of the, the data that we were uh, analyzing and, um, uh, and studies, gathering studies to support all the work and all the details uh, of our project. And uh, uh, I invite you to, to go further in detail. Uh, we have uh, here a couple of uh, ways to, to get to, to the resources of our project via the platform of um, uh, DTU uh, organizing the webinar today and also on the, um, the European Commission uh, called this page of the, of the project where you can find the deliverables of different, uh, our different work packages. And um, uh, for, for following with the other topics of, our, of this uh, research uh, background for the project, uh, we will continue with uh, the, the evaluation of uh, green homes and then uh, with the, the also recalling the, the context uh, relationship with the, the European Green Taxonomy and the alignment with uh, recent uh, policy evolution like uh, levels as well. So, Andre, uh, I give the floor to you. So, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Andre Botis. I'm the current president of uh, Romania Green Building Council. I'm uh, very happy to be part of this. Uh, beautiful uh, international and uh, uh, one of the most exciting projects uh, in the current uh, environment. When uh, when Steve started this project uh, like about 15 years ago in Romania, I was uh, one of the first dreamers uh, in this. And with, with this project, uh, basically one, one of the uh, greenest Steve's uh, dreams uh, becomes true. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, huge opportunity. And uh, thank you very much for the entire team that worked very hard to, to push this uh, forward. Uh, I'm, I'm also involved uh, in the professional life within a valuation company based in Bucharest with a national coverage. Is the is the only <clears throat> uh, valuation company listed at the stock exchange in the in the region. So, uh, basically, using my expertise in the valuation and the uh, uh, expertise and experience working with the Romanian Green Building Council in the past years, we've put together uh, a material that will help a lot of people uh, when uh, it's required to do valuation, not only for the financial institution, but for uh, all of the projects where uh, valuation is required. So <clears throat> basically, real estate valuation are critical in the entire real estate market. Uh, real estate valuation is crucial 
for all the investments, uh, for minor or ma major investments, the value expert's opinion should rely on on approval tools, on existing tools. So w within th this project, we, we gather some uh, important data from uh, uh, entire Europe that uh, will help all the valuers to, to provide green valuation going uh, further. Uh, the, the entire research, it's uh, open to, to be read on the Copenhagen Center for uh, of, on, on Energy Efficiency. And within this research, uh, besides our colleagues uh, within Romania Green Building Council, we were also supported by um, national, um, by the Academy of Economic Studies in Bucharest and by uh, ANEVAR. ANEVAR, which is the local association of the valuers, in, is, uh, ANEVAR is one of the largest valuation association in the world. It has around 4,000 members. Uh, ANEVAR is used as standards, international valuation standards, uh, and it's also in the board of TEGOBA, um, and it's uh, being present internationally, internationally at the uh, all of the international valuation conferences. So basically, we've gathered a, a lot of experts within the search. Uh, I'm happy to present this and to invite everybody to visit uh, uh, the website. You have here the link. Uh, some of the key findings within this research, uh, we've seen that uh, we, we have a positive impact on the uh, market trend. Uh, we have uh, now an increasing demand in, in the past five years. We have uh, an increasing demand by the occupiers to, to live in the green buildings. The service charge and the maintenance has, are lower. Uh, the less construction work for the new occupiers. Uh, increased state of health for the tenants. Increasing productivity of the people working in the green buildings. Uh, the cost of energy, of course, are lower, and the cost of later upgrading are uh, lower. And we can see here um, some uh, figures where um, we can see exactly the, the financial uh, figures. So how we can uh, increase the, the people to which develop buildings to invest in, in, in green buildings. We can see that the discount rate, uh, let's say that it's, uh, it's, it's decreasing. So basically it reaches to a higher value uh, on the long term. The, the rental is increasing. So uh, we have all the, the reasons here. Another thing that I want to talk about is that um, we are going to organize a financial valuation course uh, on the 13th of October. You are all invited to attend. We will be uh, letting you prior with the link too. Um, in Romania, about four months ago, we had a big su success. We were part uh, in the task group organized by National Bank of Romania, together with uh, more than 80 experts from different institutions, from the World Bank, from the National Bank of Romania, from the government, from the presidency, from the European Investment Bank, from European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, from other consultants uh, locally and uh, internationally. And uh, basically, National Bank of Romania, it launched the uh, first guide how to finance green uh, uh, buildings in uh, in Romania and uh, not uh, only that but within this research uh, our program green homes and the smarter were, were referred so uh, uh, after that uh, the, the increase of uh, uh, financial institution to adopt our program has been raised up and it continues to raise. Stephen showed you that uh, we are still having another partners joining the program and uh, we are positive that by the end uh, we'll have uh, ma uh, many more. 
I hope that uh, my uh, information was useful for you. I uh, thank you again and I invite you to the 13th uh, seminar on the financial consideration of green buildings. I hope to see you all soon and uh, all the best. I will give the word to Sebastiano Cristoforetti. Thank you very much. Greetings from Northern Italy and, and thanks, Andre, for. So, when just uh, small notes linked to what Andre uh, mentioned, the coming webinar uh, addressing valuers and banks. This is part of a pathway made of a, a, a strategy to train uh, and increase the availability of trained professionals, valuers, uh, over the dozen countries we have, and smarter in uh, being capable of appraising properly a green certified home and based on current best practices which are represented by the national banks uh, uh, best practice in, in Romania and by the fact that uh, Anivar is part of both of IBC and Togoma. So we have <laughs> the best in classes by far. Coming to this presentation, I would like to focus if I am capable on some key elements uh, which are uh, concerning levels and the EU taxonomy mostly, and with some you know, uh, uh, glances to the data structure we have in Smarter. Uh, many of the topics have been already touched by the previous presenters, uh, and I would like hence to, to introduce this presentation by mentioning something which you, you might have he heard about or read, Hopefully, if you are a technician, which is the recent commission's notice, of, uh, which is a technical guidance on the climate proofing of infrastructure in the coming strategic six years ahead. This is connected, of course, to a variety of regulations, which are mentioned at the bottom, but mostly to the recovery and resilient facility, which is uh, the uh, trillions of euro, as you know. Uh, what is it about? It is about two of the main environmental objectives in the taxonomy regulations. Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, climate neutrality and climate resilience, or in other words, mitigation and adaptation to climate change. What I am interested to stress here is that climate proofing any physical asset, and by this meaning also buildings and private homes, as it is mentioned uh, at the bottom left, um, means securing all the, the financial assets which are placed on top of it. And hence, we, you have seen already two times uh, this slide, if, if not three, uh, three times. Uh, again, we see that this is connected to climate proofing for physical and financial assets, and especially looking at the main two, uh, the two main first um, environmental objectives, climate change mitigation and adaptations, for which we have today technical screening criteria, the others are coming. Quite swiftly on these slides, I put some additional slides, which I won't share in detail during this presentation, but I will leave it happily for, for reference and happy to, to dip in, into uh, the further Q&A session. The new taxonomy asks you to comply to four main uh, requests. To, to provide a substantial contribution to at least one of the environmental objectives, uh, for example, uh, mitigation, to com uh, comply to the technical scoring criteria, including the do no significant harm for all other environmental objectives, and to comply, of course, to some minimum safeguards for labor, etc. Uh, so, what's levels? We have been speaking about that a few times before. Levels is a common framework for assessing and reporting, which is not in itself something directly usable for a certification. It is an open, common framework to uh, is, mm, share a common language for uh, measuring the sustainability performances of the buildings, any sort of buildings at any stage of the life cycle. It is crucially centered on circular economy aligned to all uh, long-term strategies for the European uh, Commission and Union, and it embeds uh, uh, an all-round um, LCA, LCC approach, life cycle approach for the impact on environment and for costs. 
Uh, I won't stand on these lines just to, uh, just to say that within levels, we have things which are spanning from energy and greenhouse emissions, uh, including global warming potential and cool LCA, which we are capable of handling and we do handle the 4 billion euros worth in levels. Uh, Uh, despite its, you know, initially steep learning curve, but eventually it is easily uh, utilizable, easily deployable, and we do that over a variety of countries today. Um, water efficiency, healthy and comfortable spaces, which is crucial for the risk in the homes, so when you, you think about borrowers, etc. And um, just a few moments more on this. There's a couple of areas, adaptation and resilience to climate change, which considers, for example, increased risk or extreme weather, and uh, the response of the building to events which are changing over time. And the time which we keep for typical life cycle, time frame for a building spans, well, depending, the investments can be 30 years old, 25, but the building itself, 52 to 100, of course, and optimized life cycle cost and value, which do relate to the same consistent life cycle uh, assessment approach. Here, perhaps this is a key slide uh, as it is meant to be. This is all about standardizing uh, or providing a meta standard, a common language to choose what to measure and how to assess if a building is green. So that's an engineering era brain up problem issue. At the bottom, you have the financial performance of an asset, a portfolio of buildings, a credit portfolio made of mortgages backed up into a, scenario, into a secondary market. In between, there's the IT world. So buildings, data, and um, cockpits for any rating scoring monitoring system for the financial performance. Uh, Levels is crucial because it allows you, us, all together to share a common language together in a normally, enormously greater amount of data and to achieve the necessary um, understanding and decision capacity which we aim to. Just a snapshot, levels is on the right while smarter is on the left in between other rating systems and certification schemes. The icons represent uh, the environmental, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, objectives of the uh, EU taxonomy. And there you see that levels covers most of them, uh, while smarter do covers the, the full list, which is not the case for most of the rating systems in the tree. We are embedding levels into a dozen countries today and growing, as you've seen, almost 800 million people countries. We are in constant uh, connection with the European Commission. As you can see on the right, we have been published last year, more than a year ago, uh, during the COVID, on the official newsletter from the Commission regarding levels, uh, where we were presented as a best practice because of the fact that we are incorporating embedded nesting levels into a dozen uh, rating systems in a dozen countries, allowing hence to have consistency over such an enormous amount of markets. Um, just some comments here, leaving it for reference. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from levels, uh, and it is uh, a list of uh, the indicators Within levels, uh, in between you see the macro objectives, which is a different language, uh, um, from greenhouse uh, uh, gas reduction to, to optimize life cycle costs, etc. Uh, so the, the uh, boxes which are uh, flagged on to the right are the ones which are relevant for valuation and risk uh, information. And these are in levels and embedded into, into the system. So, More actually, um, levels even have attention and transparency to data quality, for example, which is something very, very crucial and very sophisticated, but it is something we are gladly happy to to, to deepen in, in another uh, session. From uh, just a comment here on the right, levels on the left, you have 
the EU taxonomy. This is just to say in, in a few uh, seconds that, uh, as you have seen in the previous slides, Levels is designed to answer the questions of the EU taxonomy, so to say. So it is a tool we can use to measure, assess, and ensure, and via certifications, uh, um, well, ensure, provide warranty onto that uh, regarding uh, environmental performance of buildings, spanning from energy to a lot of indicators and performances which are going much beyond. Uh, the key here is that if you embed levels on the left top, um, which is using the metrics for the EU taxonomy, and you embed that into the certifications, bottom, middle, uh, then when you get a green home, which is certified, you can provide evidence that you have achieved alignment to the EU taxonomy on the physical assets. And this is the key foundation for any further intermediate or final financial asset, because you have independent, credible, transparent, technical verification on this. Just a few moments on this last element, which is a part of the uh, research body we have. We have considered also what happens after you get a certification of, of a building. Uh, do we monitor anything? Yes, we do. We do monitor. Uh, data which is uh, consistent over the countries, uh, thanks to levels, uh, and not just that. Uh, we have considered the best references, such as the EPIGS DEEP and the uh, European Mortgage Federation's EDAP, uh, which are designed for energy efficiency investments properly. We also have considered with DEEP uh, some potential in uh, using their system for something which is not just uh, energy efficiency project, but new buildings, for example. Um, and we typically measure all the relevant performances, uh, uh, both for the you know, green home side and the bank side, uh, belonging to the performance of the building, uh, such as, for example, uh, energy consumption for each carrier, energy cost, water consumption, water cost, renewable shares, and impact of renewables, and annual maintenance cost. This is for years after a mortgage is issued and a home is in operation. Um, well, happy to to discuss more in, in the coming moments and back to Steve, the project director. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sebastiano, for, for that. I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about uh, next steps. And um, I will, I think we've had, unfortunately, some technical issues with our colleague from the Czech Republic, Peter Zaradnik. Uh, who's been really a, the organization we've, we've really collaborated with for, for many years and pleased to be working on this. Uh, so what I'll do is I will basically summarize his presentation uh, and we will, when we share the details with all of the attendees, we'll be sure to, to include the, the, the key points of research. Um, but basically, uh, Peter is working on a task uh, for banks to uh, review and analyze uh, the relationship between uh, green buildings and uh, mortgage default risk. And uh, we looked at studies prior to that uh, regarding the, uh, the, the, the findings of, of other studies that showed a, a very clear uh, correlation. Uh, in a U.S. study of about 70,000 houses across all climate zones with relatively low energy cost uh, in the United States indicated a 32% fall in mortgage default rates if the uh, Energy Star uh, rating for a building was used, which I should say is it is a good program, but is not as ambitious as the NZEP standards uh, and, and certainly not um, equal to the standard we're applying through, through our uh, consortium. So with higher energy costs in, in Europe and with many climate zones, we think this is actually very comparable information. But through this project, what we wanted to do was also, of course, look at more European data. Obviously, uh, through EFIG, uh, through through the EMAP project, the, the deep database, um, many of these uh, initiatives, uh, this, this correlation has been examined. Uh, but we wanted to make an appeal to you, our banking partners, um, both the existing and also to those considering joining, uh, to work together to basically look at your existing portfolios 
and examine if there's a correlation between uh, energy performance and mortgage default risk in your existing portfolios. Obviously, we won't have that many green, uh, fully green certified uh, projects, but we think the energy um, energy audit, the energy uh, certificate is a good proxy for the moment. So uh, I, I will happily introduce you to Peter to, to follow up if this is of interest, uh, uh, but certainly uh, get in touch on that point. Uh, just to, uh, to, to uh, quote, conclude here, uh, I think some of the, the key points that I, I hope were very clear, but obviously banks have an interest in aligning with the EU taxonomy. I think there's a lot of interest there, and I hope we've showed you uh, that we have uh, a very practical uh, yet comprehensive plan uh, to do so. Uh, also that you need a credible governance of, of uh, how you define green homes and how you decide to, to make your green finance, green mortgage products available uh, using uh, the energy audits that are verified, but also with levels framework, as Sebastiano uh, uh, pointed out in detail and, and with some really excellent research underlying that. Uh, but also we think that green finance really should be a transformational opportunity. This idea of the cost of ownership, the total cost of ownership, uh, is really transformational. That unlocks a lot of design and construction budget uh, that is critical to reaching a very high performing building. And I think this is this is something, where, again, where we want the banks to be the heroes of sustainability, bringing forward these these fantastic products. Uh, we really effectively were, were nonprofit organizations and expert groups encouraging people that they should should borrow money to do the, do the job properly. And that has been a problem. Uh, creating some of the deficiencies in our building stock, and we now have a solution. And lastly, the, this idea of building blocks, the name of our webinar today. Uh, actually, my, my colleague who presented earlier, Ted Cronmiller, and I, we met uh, in Washington, D.C. on a project uh, for a large, let's say, secondary mortgage uh, market maker. And uh, this was pr prior to the 2008 uh, financial crisis. And Ted can certainly attest that I was always confused how a bunch of poor products or let's say poor assets, when you put them together, that suddenly they can become a, uh, a, very, a very nice asset, an A-rated uh, financial risk. And I still don't understand it. But as we look forward with green mortgages and green finance, we wanted to make sure that they design the system from top to bottom, that the building blocks, the individual houses, the homes, uh, the buildings that go into these portfolios, these institutional uh, investment products, that they themselves are truly consistent with with the, the taxonomy, with an ambitious definition of green, and most importantly, what our planet needs. And I, my appeal is that we are really, uh, I, I think we've all we all know we're we're at the last moments that we can really make a difference for our children, uh, the, the the planet that they're going to inherit. Uh, so next steps, uh, very simply, connect with us. Uh, I'll, you'll see my email uh, shortly, uh, but I'd like to invite anyone, if, if you don't know where to find the information, contact me, and I'll be very happy to, uh, uh, to, to send that to you directly and uh, net help you navigate uh, through our project and get you the, the right information. Uh, the available tools and research, take a look. We've got uh, plenty of this. and. Also, uh, to engage with the network for greening the financial system, uh, which as banks, this is these, your national banks have either joined or will join shortly, we believe. Uh, this is really a good thing. And also uh, get involved with our organizations. We, we run a green finance task group that uh, my, co my colleague Andre, who, who presented just a bit earlier, uh, was the, was uh, uh, is leading that group. Uh, and, we're, and we're having much success uh, engaging with the industry, and we encourage all of you to do that uh, with your local organizations as well. So with that, um, I want to say thank you to all of you, uh, but also uh, to the Copenhagen Center for, for arranging this and doing really an excellent job uh, at, at, at putting everything together and, and to leading our European Advisory Board, uh, to all my project colleagues, uh, to the European Commission, uh, who's really the support is 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 we're very thankful for uh, to grow this, and um, also to all of you who uh, uh, are looking to be green leaders as we move forward. 
So I will uh, turn it back uh, to uh, Aristides and to the, the questions and answers uh, as they come in. Thank you very much, Stephen. We received several questions from the audience. But I would like to ask from you, Stephen, Camilo, Marco, Sebastiano, and Ted to activate our web cameras so people will be able to see who are behind uh, that event. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll start uh, with the first, uh, the first question is, what opportunities are there for a bank that already has an energy efficiency mortgage? What steps should it take to move to a more holistic green market? Should it be market in a different way? I think it's for you, Stephen. Sure, uh, it's a great question. I, I, I think the, um, and just to step back for a second, uh, definitely the energy efficient mortgages, are, we think are a great step forward uh, because as I mentioned earlier and, and my colleagues as well, energy is such an important part of the cost driver. So any sort of discounted mortgage that enables a building to be more energy efficient and, and to, it, to integrate green energy is really a, a huge step forward. Uh, that said, we, uh, along with the EU taxonomy and the direction that's going in and the do no significant harm criteria, of course, we want to move to a more holistic green mortgage. So what I would say is the, the, the mortgage is definitely going in the right direction. Uh, They're obviously looking at the energy certificate already. And so now we just need to apply the green criteria. And this is the case where uh, the so asking for not only the energy certificate, but also the green certificate uh, will allow you to upgrade that uh, mortgage product to a true green mortgage. And the, the really the intent of our project was to take this very complicated, is it green or not green decision and turn it into a binary yes or no decision on behalf of the bank. And we're very pleased to share with you how we do that process. The banks are invited also to internalize as much of the process as they wish, but the point being they don't have to. They can basically uh, uh, do this very quickly with, um, uh, uh, with, with the support of uh, our partnership. So uh, I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, the next question is about uh, Croatia, and uh, the question goes, Croatia is also one of the countries highlighted on the Smarter Map. Can you please share more detail, details about the project progress in Croatia and on the banks that are interested to participate in the Green Homes and Green Mortgage Program? Sure. So, so we've signed a partnership with the Croatia Green Building Council uh, to implement the program. They're currently in the process of adapting the tools, the, these toolkits, legal agreements, uh, promotional materials as well. Uh, we have not established an official launch date, uh, but we hope to uh, before uh, the, the mid-November is our sort of um, uh, target date that we're looking for all of our partners to, to have an official launch and have things available. But uh, I'd invite people to, to contact them directly or, or feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to make an introduction uh, to learn more details about their plan. Thanks, Stephen. The next question is, are there certifications outside of the Smarter Consortium uh, eligible? There are. So, so we presented, so, so just to emphasize, each of us have adapted uh, certifications uh, specific for green homes. Uh, all of our partners have one. Uh, but at the same time, where there's other things, uh, for those who've been working in commercial real estate, uh, you've probably seen a lot of lead Certifications, BRIAM, uh, DGMB, HQE, Verde out of Spain. You know, there's many really um, top class certifications that, that are existing. So our uh, our effort is not to say one is the only way to do it, uh, but to work together and, and really keep the focus on achieving the highest levels of certification. So just to use LEED as an example, what, what we would do uh, in, in our uh, locality, we would look for someone to achieve a LEED Platinum on uh, the building. And then we would also look that um, there, are, there are just a couple things that we require, such as a indoor air quality test prior to occupancy, so they could achieve the LEED Platinum. We would check that it had been done uh, on the ground correctly. We then look at um, maybe a, just a couple more criteria, such as the indoor air quality test. And when that's complete, uh, we then indicate to our banking partner that that this is a qualified product. So it, it works very well, particularly, you know, we don't want to tell the developers, investors, if they have a preference. Uh, 
And as long as we're comfortable with the certification and the ones I mentioned, we're very comfortable with. And there's certain other ones out there as well. So it, it's designed to be open source and focus on on verifying uh, proper achievement. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I just want to mention that you can send us your, your, your question using the dedicated icon. And uh, the next question is, what capabilities does a bank need to, uh, to create and process green mortgages and green loans? Uh, thanks, Arce. So I can take that, you know, very, very concisely. Um, I think, you know, the environmental performance certification, um, like Smarter, is is foundational to that. Um, in terms of additional capabilities, it's really translating the environmental risk, the physical risk, and the transition risk, which we effectively eliminate transition risk. We reduce physical risk into categories of different types of financial risk. So that goes back to the environmental performance coefficient. So what we do is we have four methodologies that translate environmental risk reduction to financial risk reduction, which then allows a bank to very easily and very in a, in a very traceable and trans, transparent manner adapt their financial product sets to the environmental profile of a property, a project, or a portfolio. That then provides the foundation for those products to go into pools that can go onto the secondary market. So it can be very, there can be a very clear linkage between the certification, the EU taxonomy alignment, the um, alignment with the EU green bond standard and investor expectations. So from a foundational from the foundational level, certification provides a very um, a very clear uh, pathway to linking environmental performance to um, to the you know financial profile of a mortgage and, and related products. And if I could just add, I, I think Ted did a great job where, you know, where we talked about the underwriting advantages. And, and risk analysis, uh, but I think even uh, in its simplest form too, that the, that the uh, the capabilities to actually assess the buildings are something that the bank can decide. They can they can work with a trusted partner, which which this is what we believe um, we've created a, a, a basis for that trust and a, and a very comprehensive program. Uh, they can internalize uh, this process. Uh, of which case uh, we can also support and help. Uh, but and typically we found our partners are, are happy to have us focus on the certification. They do their expertise in, in the finance. Uh, but I really think uh, a lot of the points that Ted is making, that's really going to be the evolution of this is as banks get to see the underwriting benefits of green mortgages, green homes, uh, the desire to, to promote them even more, uh, I think is going to grow. Thank you very much, uh, Ted and Stephen. Uh, the next question is, why banks are not willing to reduce the loan's interest rate when renovations are concerned? I don't know who would like to respond to that question. Well, can I just add that I'm, I'm not sure that there's definitely banks that do not have a renovation project, but, but we have in, in Romania a number of banks that have specialized um, a green mortgage, I mean, sorry, a green loan for, specifically for renovation with a preferential rate. So uh, the, the same, we talked a, a bit about new construction, at least uh, definitely in my presentation, but uh, we've designed the program to work with renovations. So, um, and, and the other thing we've seen in a lot of markets, um, I'm, I'm not sure which country uh, the question came from, but, but in a lot of markets, particularly that I've seen in Central Eastern Europe, uh, there are programs, for example, EBRD is supporting uh, banks to on land to uh, through other banks to to citizens uh, based on the choices they make, uh, whether it's it's more, um, let's say, system by system implementation or a more holistic deep renovation. But um, so, so I would say that there, there, there are the, the good news. We do start to see discounted renovation uh, uh, loans. And so. That, I just want to add that. Aris, can I add something on this quite shortly? Yes, please go ahead, Sebastiano. Yeah, quickly. Just a quick reference to the DEEP and EDAP initiatives, which we saw a, a moment before. When it, um, typically, I mean, uh, there has been a, a greater attention to the data and the information belonging to the borrower, which is who or whom, if you want, while instead the attention to the what is the collateral, if you have you know, a mortgage, or 
the physical entity which is underlying any business initiative, if it is a, a loan to a developer, for example, which we have in, in, in our countries uh, linked to, to Smarter, this is growing. Of course, it is growing into deep and it is it has been growing into EMAP, EDAP, and the family of funded projects, uh, which is well, governed by, by the European Mortgage Federation. This is even more or true when it comes to green buildings and back to uh, energy efficiency measures and projects. These are typically, typically, usually poorer in terms of information belonging to the physical assets. What's before, what's later, after the renovation intervention. So uh, a bank perhaps is still more attentive to the home, the borrower, instead of being attentive to the what. Because if a project is good in itself, you know, risk is decreasing uh, in, in a very important way. Thank you, Sebastiano. Uh, we're almost at the end of uh, the event. It's almost two full hours. Uh, I don't know, Stephen, would you like to add the final remarks to that event before we close it? Just a quick just a quick note to say my, my colleague Andre Bodic is is here just slightly off camera. So uh, if, if there had any green financial valuation questions, but also uh, you see my email uh, in the chat box. So feel free to email me and I will pass them to him. And and uh, we hope you can also join join that event. But but just again, uh, I'm really humble with all of the fantastic work that everybody's done and. Um, and, and really looking forward. I think we're really just beginning, though. We're going to see a huge amount of transformation uh, uh, driven from this from this region and, and with our new partners abroad. So, so thank you, everyone. So, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come to the end of the webinar. I would like to say thanks to the panelists and for the informative and interesting presentations and to the audience for their active participation. We hope that the presentation will be beneficial for all stakeholders involving in energy efficiency and the building sector. Thank you for your attention and wish you a good day or night from Copenhagen.